Hey everybody, this is Ryan, and in this video we're going to talk about the feral effect and biologic wit, and how these two relatively complicated dental topics play a role in determining the restorability of teeth. So, what is a feral? Well, it's defined as a ring or cap, typically a metal one, that strengthens something and prevents it from splitting or wearing. So this word comes from a combination of these Latin words, ferrum for iron and viriola for bracelet. And so it's technically an iron band that encircles something to give it strength. So an example would be like at the end of this paintbrush, there's this little metal piece that reinforces the bristles at the end, or the iron rings around a barrel that help give it strength and support. So, how does this relate to dentistry? So a dental ferrule is defined as a band that encircles the external dimension of tooth structure. So what the heck does that mean? Basically, the dental ferrule includes both the axial walls and the margin, which is right at the edge here, this crown, which engage the axial walls of the prepared tooth. So. Here we have a tooth that has been prepared to receive a crown, and the coronal structure has been reduced in order that a certain thickness of crown material can fit on top without being overly bulky. In this case, there isn't any decay, there is no root canal treatment, no post and core, so it's a relatively straightforward case. Technically, the ferrule is therefore the entire axial wall of the crown which contacts and braces up against this axial tooth structure. So this provides a lot of fracture resistance and lateral force resistance. But let's get to a case where ferrule is a more important consideration. So from this paper, um, here's a drawing, and we have two examples of teeth that were prepared to receive crowns. However, these teeth have already undergone a root canal treatment and they required a core filling material, shown by this rectangle here, to restore the missing and decayed coronal tooth structure, and they had a post placed in the root canal system in order to retain the core. So root canal treatment, post, and core, pretty classic setup for a tooth that's been through a lot. So one of these is good, and one of these is a bad design. And I want you to figure out which one looks stronger right off the bat. Well, I guess the picture sort of gives it away because this one has a, a feral setup, which makes it inherently stronger. But let's explain why. The flat top tooth here offers no resistance to lateral forces. And let me get uh, a pen here to show you that if we were to, say, have lateral leverage forces on the crown, of course, here's the crown, it would be fitting on top of this core, any lateral leverage on the crown during function would transfer solely to the core material and then would translate to lateral forces from the post. And so there's nothing stopping all those forces from translating to the core. But this one has a little staircase of natural tooth structure here that this one does not have. And uh, just like our normal prep from the last slide, it's similar, but there's a lot of coronal tooth structure missing because of decay or, or something like that. So the wall of natural tooth structure right here is much shorter than the previous example, but the, even this little staircase of tooth structure provides a place for the crown margin and the axial wall to brace against natural tooth structure so that it can better resist lateral forces from the post and leverage from the crown and function. So it's sharing the um, application of force against this, this wall. So the, the tooth is able to absorb this, and then the PDL is able to share the, the blame, not just the core and the post. So, according to some clinical research, 1.5 millimeters should be the minimum feral length when restoring a root-filled maxillary central incisor with a post and core retained crown. 1.5 
is a pretty widely accepted minimum for all teeth. And I know this gets confusing, but the 1.5 millimeters of ferrule refers to the crown, the aspect of the crown which contacts the natural tooth, which in turn needs to be 1.5 millimeters high. So that's uh, depicted by this bracket here. So now we got feral, so let's talk about biologic width next. So biologic width refers to the attachment of periodontium to the tooth above the bone. So between the bone and the tooth here is the periodontal ligament. But above this, and technically below in this picture because it's depicting an upper tooth, is first a connective tissue layer, a connective tissue attachment to the tooth, and above that is an epithelial attachment to the tooth, which is the weakest of the attachment layers. And both the connective tissue and epithelial attachment layers together constitute the biologic attachment, aka biologic width. Now on average, as shown in this picture from uh, Spear Education, the average is about one millimeter for each of these layers for a total of two millimeters of biologic width. So if we were placing a veneer or a crown, it must not impinge on this biologic width, especially on the facial margin. If it does, you'll cause inflammation, the tissue will get red and recede, and you can even get bone loss as the tissue tries to literally recreate this two millimeters of natural attachment that you invaded with some foreign crown material. So this is the danger zone. We want to stay away from impinging on this attachment at all costs. Now in order to avoid getting anywhere close to this, we usually try to stay super gingival, which means above the gingiva. But if we have to, we can position a crown margin slightly subgingival, or below the gingiva. Since a sulcus, as shown here, is usually not less than one millimeters deep. If you go no more than 0.5 millimeters below the gingiva, you're generally pretty safe. So we'll say if you came like somewhere around here with your crown margin, and this is, again, these are all averages. Every patient is different, which is important. Say on average we go um, 0.5 millimeters below the gingiva, Again, since the sulcus is usually not less than one millimeters, you're generally pretty safe. So this allows, at the very least, a, different, a distance of 2.5 millimeters from the bone level to the restorative margin of our crown here. So that's another important number, that 2.5 millimeters. Okay, so with this information, let's look at the second image. We have uh, to have at least 2.5 millimeters from bone to crown margin for the biologic width that we just talked about. And if we add in our ferrule of 1.5 millimeters from the last slide, we get a grand total of 4 millimeters from the height of the ferrule to the height of the bone. All right, so now let's apply this to a clinical case to help illustrate all these concepts. So let's say on this molar, number 30, we need to, to replace this restoration with a crown because there is extensive decay underneath, for example. This would be a situation when we need to consider both feral and biologic width. So say we remove this old restoration and we effectively have this much natural two structure remaining after we do so, hypothetically. Um, notice we don't have any stair steps here. We have you know, a really long one here, but of course we can't make the crown margin this thick. So we would need to make up uh, our stair step further down in order to achieve that ferrule effect. So we'll say maybe here we will have to drop our margin in order to get 
again that 1.5 millimeters bracing up against natural tooth. But then we can't stop there. We also need to go another 2.5 millimeters and we have to stay 2.5 millimeters away from the height of bone so that we're sure that we're not impinging on that natural attachment that does not want to be interrupted. And you notice by this point we are way into bone, so what can we do about that? Is this tooth actually restorable? Well simply put, we can do clinical crown lengthening and move the bone down, or orthodontic extrusion and move the tooth up. Now this is an oversimplification, but if these uh, methods are valid, then we can restore this tooth, but otherwise, if we cannot obtain feral and we cannot stay away from biologic width without um, interrupting or disrupting the adjacent teeth, then this tooth would no longer be considered restorable. Again, this is an oversimplification, but hopefully it makes sense in terms of treatment planning, determining if a tooth is restorable or not, and ultimately doing what's best for your patients. So I hope you found this video helpful. Please leave a like and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Thanks so much for watching, guys, and I'll see you all in the next video.